Hello, my darlings. Welcome to our next episode, Tragedy to Triumph. It's a great comeback story. I know you're going to love it. I'm Gayla Bentley, your style savvy guru. And with me is the fabulous Masha Ree Emily. And today we're going to tell you a story, a story like no other. So before we begin, I just wanted to thank you all for being so supportive and commenting and subscribing to our YouTube channel. So let's start. You might remember there was a little hurricane called Hurricane Harvey that happened. Well, it struck Houston, Texas in 2017, the very end of that. So before that happened, we were living happily ever after in our homes that we'll tell you a little bit about in a moment. And one day we start receiving hurricane alerts. And see, you receive them a lot when you live off a coast. So you take it lightly, but seriously at the same time. So in both my case, and in Ma Cherie's case, as women, not to be generalizing, but we took it more seriously initially, hoping our husbands would take it just as seriously as we did. To be fair, our husbands, I think, are very similar in that when, whereas Gigi and I might write, might react with a little bit of panic and anxiety, anxiety and right. concern for the family, it becomes a little chaotic. Yes, we. We have these lovely, wonderful husbands who, in a way, try to suppress that anxiety and panic That's mode. So and again, back to that Gulf Coast feeling. I mean, we this happens to us so often. And, you know, sometimes things blow through and it, it they make a big deal out of it. And then it never happens. It was when the water starts seeping in from underneath the front doors when you take it quite seriously. Let's tell you why we chose the houses we chose to live in before they were destroyed. For us, our home was chosen. It was only the second house we looked at, and we chose it because my best friend lived across the street, and I wanted to be close to her. And as soon as we walked in the house, it was open living, and the backyard was a pool with a bridge going over the pool, a diving board, and a slide, which we knew all of our friends and their children would love. And the, Master bedroom was on the first floor with a fireplace in it as well. The living room had a fireplace. We're like, this is it. I'm going to take charge, make a decision person. I know if it's going to be for us or not. Put a bid on it, bought it, and that was it. What about you, Mashuri? So similarly, we had uh, that feeling when you see the house and you walk in the house. But in our case, we had been looking for a very long time. And we decided that we needed to look for a place where the kids would each have their own room. And of course we would have our room. And then we were able to have a guest room, hopefully for friends to come and visit. We have friends who visit from overseas and out of town often, and also our, our my in-laws. Right. And so that was very important. Mm -hmm. And we had been looking at this particular house for some time. I had seen it online and then it has a nice big backyard. So we had, you know, the opportunity to buy or not buy, but adopt. We adopted our dogs. We adopted another dog. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so, um, yes, the kids were very happy. And we were just, like you said, living our happily ever after. But what we didn't know is initially is how we would decorate it. But that's not really a problem for us because we are the divas behind living in personal style. So immediately we set out to decorate our homes. And it was really fun for me because I never, I always, always lived in one place for eight to 10 years. I'm not a big mover. So this was my forever home. And at this point, before the flood, we had lived in our house almost 28 years. So this home was filled with a lot of treasures from us traveling around the world and things I pick up and feel like I have to restore, et cetera. But some of the real treasures that were heartbreaking to me was what you're seeing right now is this mural. Originally, the mural is a painting by Jack Petrano, and I love his things because he uses a lot of imagery with people and creates a scene of people doing activities that are always either romantic or um, James Bond-like or interesting. I thought it'd be so cool to do a mural in my dining room, and you can't even see where the door is because the artist painted right over the door. And these are the three men that he had originally in his artwork but we changed the faces to be the faces of the men that were in our lives at the time. There's Russell with a cigar, 
our friend Richard, who's a decorator with his cigarette, and Fritz, who is my everything man, for helping me. He was my work husband. And their initials are on their collars or on their cufflinks. And she personalized it, taking poetic um, artistic license to do so. And it took her months to do it. And that was a whole a relationship that we had because she would be sleeping over here on the weekends. And, um, you know, we just slowly got this mural done. So that made it very personal for us. And for me, one of the things that I always loved is getting ready with my husband, but I didn't like him to see me until I was already dressed to give the voila reveal. So there was a master sunken marble bathtub in the main bathroom. And I didn't want to use that because of something you read about in my book that changed everything. Very interesting. I boarded it up and built a high vanity there. And I built a whole vanity that had silk dupiné curtains that came from it and topiaries and all the things beautiful. And then I shielded it with fabric I purchased on the streets in Paris that you could see through with little baby white tulips. And then behind the, that drape, you saw the vanity. And that's where I put my makeup on and I had my outfit in there and I'd get dressed and I'd walk out and say, darling, I'm ready to go out for the evening. And he'd always have wonderful things to say to me. Then as you can also see the lips coat. Lips is the acronym that we use here at Style Savvy, live in personal style. So lips have always been my trademark and had to get the couch when we found it. And then something funny to throw in was Skipper Bentley, the dog that we rescued. She had the best dog bed, but she found that the fishnet couch would become her dog bed. And that's what made her feel at home. Then you'll see my living room. And this is one of many different ways it was. This is probably towards the 27th year of living in it because I can see things in it that were pictures that I took in Paris, black and whites, and um, other pictures that other artists have, have drawn and pillows that we made in my design firm and leather chairs my grandfather bought me and just decorating with things that were all heartfelt and roses that Russell had sent me and the bookcase with me in front of it collecting books as I always did because as a woman with curves, I couldn't always buy clothes, but I could buy books. They always fit me and I love them. And of course my bar, which was always active because people would stop by. And you know, when people would stop by my house when I was growing up, the first thing my mother or father would say, would you like a drink? Whether it would be alcoholic or a soft drink. And then what would you like to eat with that? So I had to have an ongoing operative bar at all times. So we just made it a fun place for people to visit and a home that we could enjoy. And Emily had such a great house that she created for her and her family. Yes, we were very fortunate to find a house with the exact right number of rooms for us. Because in order to afford this house, I had to give up my jewelry studio. Oh, wow. And so I moved my studio home. There was a beautiful room. As you can see, it was a wood paneled room. So it was very sort of- mm. um, Ralph Lorenish. Yes. <laughs> and I was able to use our table that our that my father-in-law actually made. Oh, and special. we purchased some chairs just for that purpose. We ended up putting that in there so I could do jewelry consultations, jewelry classes, et cetera. And it was a very comfortable room for, for me. And I was able to work at home, which was even better. You see my daughter's room and she had a beautiful window seat, which we actually utilized for her toys. There were drawers underneath. And so she was able to store everything. And then she had her doll collection and her doll house. And then she had Olivia. a bunk bed. Yeah. Aww. And then, um, you see the family room, which, we had that sofa, it's an Ikea sofa, and just redecorated with a nice uh, rug from Tuesday morning and some pillows. I believe that I purchased the covers from Hobby Lobby at the time, and we just decorated, you know, with what we had. We already had all and of And using your pieces. imagination, which is part of living in personal style, and that's what we do continually, daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. Absolutely. And we had moved in in 2016. May of 2016 was our first night, spending the night mm -hmm. uh, 
it was shortly before I believe the kids were out of school. So, so you only lived there almost a year before the hurricane. About a year and three months. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. So tragic. Darling, darlings. Here it is. Harvey's on the loose. Harvey's on the loose. You never know what's going to happen until it does. Here we are, moments away from exiting our house, never knowing if we'll ever get back into it again. It's pouring rain. Coast Guard boats are going back and forth in front of our homes, picking up as many people as they can, bringing them to a safe spot. I was lucky. I got the cute Coast Guard guys, darling. Yeah. And Russell and Skipper had to go on a different boat. <laughs> <laughs> I was so heartbroken. Anyway, it was fun to see Skipper dog paddle because that's the first time I ever saw him do that. But it was wild because the boat takes you through your neighborhood that you usually normally walk down. And they have to take you way outside the neighborhood to get to a dry land and then find an H, um, not H, uh, SUV that's there with volunteers ready to take you to a spot that you'll be safe. But at this point, all the churches and the high schools and grammar schools, whatever, middle schools were all already packed with people, so we had nowhere to go. So guess where we ended up going? This is an LOL. My sister's ex-husband lived near me, and we called him. He said, of course, come over. So that's where we ended up going, all of us, to his house. And his wife, um, Louise, just had piles of clothes there ready for us to try on so we could jump into something dry. And then we just sat down and went into shock. That's the beginning of my rescue. What about you, it my darling? Shocking, very shocking. So because my husband was working late at the restaurant and by the time he was able to leave, he couldn't get back into our neighborhood. So he went to sleep praying and hoping that it wouldn't flood. Of course. But unfortunately, at around 4 o'clock in the morning, it started to rain heavily again. And during that time, it was evident that the water was rising and it wasn't going to stop. Oh, so scary. So our neighbor, thankfully, came over and said, I think the best thing is to get out. And um, he had already taken his five-day-old baby and his wife oh my God. across the street to neighbors who were willing to shelter all of us. And then he helped me carry my kids across the street. And I would say the water was around four and a half feet at its deepest point. So both the kids were riding on our shoulders. Oh, my gosh. Then I had to go back and get the dogs, and it, it was very traumatic. But, you know, you just find that inner adrenaline and strength to just do it and you ignore, you shut off and then you did the same. Exactly. Yes. But you just get through it. And you went into power mode. That's right. But we were grateful yes. and, and fortunate in that regard to be, uh, to be saved and yes. to have people help us. Now, you know, where there are so many things in place within the federal government to rescue people if they need it because now we were those people. Right. That did need it, you know, and we realized that we left without our medication and medical equipment. And so, you know, we had to call certain people to try to get into the neighborhood. And they said, no, no, no. And then on the fourth or fifth day, they said it's going down from six feet to like three feet. We'll let you go in for like five minutes to get you medicine. But you have to wear the following things because they're worried about crocodiles and germs and all these other things. You have to mask, gloved, booted up to run in, and they would wait in the boat. And you had to go in, get what you wanted, and come right out. And that's what we did. And you'll see a picture here. I was so surprised. I was in shock, so I didn't get a lot to look at, but I was finding furniture in different rooms and when, when I left. And the fact that they were apart. Yes, water is. An unbelievable force. I will say also we had to go back for medication because the house where we were sheltered was occupied by a couple who were animal lovers. They... <laughs> Sorry to me to laugh, but you have to tell that story. Tell the story yes. why it's kind of humorous. So it is. It's. I mean, talk I'm very about respectful to injury. Yeah, I'm very respectful of them, but it's just an yes. interesting story. So not only did they have two dogs, and we were bringing our two dogs over. But they also 
fed all the feral cats and took care of these cats. And to be fair, they vaccinated them and right. put it to their ears and have. And how many cats are we talking about? Seventeen feral cats living that, in that house. Well, they weren't living in the house, but when it flooded, they swam to be sheltered. Oh in the my house. god! And they were very grateful to the owners. Oh. And unfortunately, my children and I are all three allergic to cats. Oh, that's the worst. So we had to go back to get medical equipment <laughs> and medication. and Just to survive that. The next 48 hours were oh my uh, gosh, quite honey. the challenge. <laughs> but, oh, a um, catastrophe yeah, of sorts. <laughs> exactly. Uh -huh. But we were also so grateful to these people because in the end, they had an apartment that was available and that's where we moved in. Oh, really? What a God thing. Isn't that fantastic? It is. So how long did you end up staying with them for? We stayed in their home for for two days, and then we moved to the apartment where we stayed for 16 months. Yeah, we moved from my ex-brother-in-law's four or five days later to a best friend's home with her and her mother and father for 18 months. People called and said, how can we help? And, you know, family calls first, and then your best friends call, and then other people that you know, like my, my friends at Iron Story Fitness, and then the Red Cross and the Samaritan's Purse. I mean, you know now is your address, and what does your address need to survive this? Wow. And people start to arrive to help you do, to keep it alive, so you don't have to tear down the whole building. Now, we flooded at different lengths and at different times. Why don't you tell us about yes, so your flooding? We flooded on the front end of the storm because we're near the bayou mm -hmm. and the storm had just parked basically over the city and rained down for days. I mean, I think we ended up with 53, 54 inches of rain wow. uh, is what they counted in the end. And definitely in our house, we had at least 36 to 36 inches or maybe even 42 inches of rain at one point if you look at the watermarks on, on the outside of my house. But for sure, it was a week before you flooded, I believe, at least a week. And the reason is because you're near the reservoir. Yes, and this, they decided the Army Corps of Engineers that they should open the floodgates to save the rest of the city from flooding more. Right. But we were in a non-flood zone. That's why we didn't have flood insurance. So the whole thing was a big shock to us all the way around. And then what's interesting, once you find your shelter and you feel so grateful and happy to be there, and then you realize the things you take for granted, like if you wanted something to eat, think about the people that had no place to go or whatever, to change their clothes, to have water, to get a place. All these things become a commodity. And people that didn't flood are in these long lines around buildings trying to get water and food for all their family and friends that did flood. It becomes a huge, you know, citywide support system, but all the goods start to go very quickly. And they jack up the prices as well. Yes. And I think for you and me both, the important thing is that we are now sharing our stories with others so that they can learn and, and we can help direct people to... Right. What are some of the first things you should do right yes, away? Absolutely. And we're going to share those tips with you at the end of this episode because um, never being through a natural disaster, you really don't have a list of who you should call right away and get in line for what you need because you don't really become logical for a week or two. And at that point, there's already thousands of people talking to FEMA and to getting in line for, you know, financially and food wise, all the stuff you need. So what was involved in your cleanup? Well, first of all, we needed a lot of help. And where were we going to get this help? And it was a miracle how the help just appeared. The gratefulness and the gratitude of the cleanup of how many people show up is priceless. You can't even put a price on that. The thing that was the most difficult and to this day still stings a bit is that they have to get to so many houses and help so many people that in cleaning out your house, they begin whipping your house out and taking every single item out of your house and throwing it on the front of your lawn. So I didn't have a moment to see if I would even consider keeping it or, or that it even left the house. 
I felt like I was being assaulted over and over again. But they didn't think about that. They just, their job was to come in and get everything out because of the mold that was going to be starting any second that was going to be hazardous to anybody's health that would be in the house. You know, where's all my rain gear, my boots? They had to cut the boots off me because my legs swelled so high. And Tammy bought me those boots. So I just kept them. I cleaned them really well and I keep them in the garage just as a keepsake to remember that I did survive the flood. There's certain things you can clean that don't have to be just thrown out in my, in my jewelry. But I could never find my jewelry, but I, I did find my grandmother's silver. So that was a wonderful reward. And I just had to let the rest of it go. But I have a lot of blessings to talk about with that later because I had lots of friends step up and fill in the things that I did lose. But it was just that assault of having it all thrown away without any discussion. And like, it was so, for me, I had some of my best friends throw some things away without talking to me. And I had to forgive them for that. I had to forgive that they made the decision without asking me about it. Like it was raining and it was raining and they're just throwing and throwing things away. And my girlfriend I gave her the recipe to wash the clothes with. She took the clothes, the recipe and the stuff that went with the recipe and then just made the decision on her own to throw the clothes away without discussing it with me. And I'm sure it was the right answer to the whole story. But I guess you just so you lose control and this, you have no control over anything. I guess that's what the scariest thing is. It is. As for us, we had friends who were alumni friends. We had parent friends from our kids' school who just stepped up and just started showing up. So it was very fortunate that we had a group that we had already networked and people put their personal time aside and came to just join in the rescue effort and then there were a lot there was a lot of bleach going on oh, uh, bleach. a Came lot of fans friends, huh? yes the dehumidifiers etc lots of cleaning and a lot of people just walking through the neighborhood randomly delivering sandwiches and sodas for example oh. to keep us going yes it's Special amazing how a city that. comes together and yes. and really you do get that help when you least expect it but most need it and make new friends in the neighborhood because of it because we're all trying to help each other absolutely and we also had to get rid of so much and you don't know that's the thing that i really want to tell people is you don't know beforehand what it's going to be like so the thing is to know when you go through something like this the perspective that i want to share is Make sure that you look up, you know, or you research. Good idea. And uh, find out what can be saved. For example, your silver, your crystal, that can be washed, that can be bleached if needed. There is a recipe for clothing, for example, that can be washed in a certain way mm -hmm. with a certain method, certain products. And they now are making laundry sanitizers, for example. And I remember at one point, um, Somebody made me turn around and I had no idea what they were doing, but they said, just stay turned around and <laughs> they carried something out. And a year later, uh, when I was looking for my wedding dress, one of the friends who had helped delivered it, cleaned and boxed and preserved back to cool. my house as a birthday gift. Oh, what a great gift. Yeah. And so they had you know, they had a process to be able to take care of that. And maybe talk to the dry cleaner. Like, I feel like my dry cleaner is holding still some of my clothes hostage. They're charging top dollar for me to pick up my clothes to this day, but they won't let me look at my clothes before I pay for them to take them out of the dry cleaner. I paid $1,000 to get one group of stuff back. Wow. But out of that whole group, only maybe 15% was, was wearable. Now they're holding hostage the rest of my stuff. I'm so dying to know what it is, to see what it is, but I don't want to put that money out. Wow. So I don't know if the city could consider, of wherever these natural disasters happen, that certain places could offer a discount to the people that have suffered. So one of the ways that I know I went in healing was to try to make some fun out of things, because that's my my personality. So when all 
and the stuff was out in the front of my lawn, I came up with this great idea to do a photo shoot. And I put the lampshade on my head. And my friend that happens to be a photographer, him and his wife helping us through the whole thing, uh, Tim, took this picture, or Kim, because they're debating who took the picture, really. Uh, <laughs> there's a big controversy over that. It happens to be my favorite picture. But it made me laugh. And trying to find joy through it all really made it worthwhile. And then my friend Lala, we decided to hold a fashion funeral. So the stuff that people just threw away randomly, we put them on the swan in the pool <laughs> and um, sent it off with a blessing. That's it. Au revoir. And if you get a chance, you can um, click onto the link and read about the fashion funeral because it ended up being a lot more fun than I imagined it to be. What were some of the fun things that you could gather up in your mind about that help relieve some of the stress? Well, it was very difficult in the beginning, but for me, the hardest part was when people who were scavenging would come to my yard and start picking through pieces of furniture. Yeah. And, you know, you're thinking this is hazardous to your health. And it was very difficult. And I finally, at one point, asked a group of people to please wait at least until I had left the property <laughs> to go picking through. But again, I think that my perspective now, and I, I can't say that much of it was very fun, but one thing that I definitely love to say now to my children, when something breaks, when something gets ruined, it's just stuff. It you. doesn't matter. It's that's it's wonderful. not people. Yes. And so that's one of our mottos. And I love it. I think it just gives you that release, you know, from the material side of things. Yes. And of course, there are sentimental things, pictures, especially that you don't that was want the to hardest lose. thing. Yeah. Using all my photographs. Absolutely. But overall, mm -hmm. it's just stuff. It's just stuff. Hello, my darlings. After these recent hurricanes, we decided it would be important to share with you experiences and what we wish someone had told us before we went through Hurricane Harvey. So we're going to tell you some great tips to prepare for these natural disasters in the future and give hope and inspiration to the people that have been through it now. This episode was filmed prior to the devastation of this hurricane season and was originally scheduled to be released in December, but we decided to move it up to share some of what we learned when we were in a similar situation. Yeah. We hope to inspire you and encourage you during your recovery, and we want to assure you that the future still holds beauty. Yes, it does. I know when people say, well, someday you look back on this, you're going to you know, say, we survived that. You're going to be stronger than ever. And whatever natural disaster you've been through, we're going to try to help you to be prepared to get through them. So this is what we came up with. We think first, you should fill out the emergency form template that Emily's going to type up for you so that you can fill in things that we're going to tell you that need to be filled in. Because when you're in an emergency situation, you don't have all your ID handy. Put it in this book, and this book is going to become your little emergency go-to preparedness yes yeah. that's what we want you to have because we didn't have that right and it should include information such as a list of emergency contact information yep. home and car insurance information medical information like doctor contacts prescriptions and insurance you won't always have your phone available because with power outages etc and so you're not going to have all those contacts necessarily available to you immediately. And you can use, you don't have to necessarily laminate it. You can use the plastic sheet protectors, but right. I do recommend laminating it because things get wet in the weirdest way in oh, which situations. We found out. Yeah, because along with, in here you have to have your medical information to make sure your prescription medications are refilled and stored in a way that makes it easy for a quick getaway, which should also be figured out beforehand just in case. So when you hear the weatherman tell you, we're getting this hurricane or, you know, the fires are starting to spread or whatever is happening. You need to make sure you get your bind road immediately. See if everything in here is updated. Then, you know, your prescriptions, you should pack just at least enough for, you know, the next 10 days, let's right. say. It's pre-prepared ahead of time. That's right. Yeah, like that's an excellent idea. Mm -hmm. 
in Ziploc baggies or pouches, whatever's yes. easy to travel with. Yes. And then also, you know, you need to call your home and insurance providers, home and car insurance. In advance. Make sure everything is up to date because in your case, yes. for example. I didn't know I didn't have flood insurance because we don't live in a flood zone, but I should have still called the insurance company. But I didn't even think of it because we never had a flood. But at the same time, now I want everybody to know whether you've had a flood or not, call your insurance. Whether you've had the fire or not, call your insurance company to make sure you have some coverage. We also suggest taking pictures of everything ahead of time. It's important to have before and after pictures. Well, you need it because when you're claiming, if you have insurance, which you, you were blessed to have, the pictures help you get back the money for ag actually what you did lose. So moving on to things like valuables oh, and yes. sentimental belongings. Yes. You want to make sure those are safe and secure. Whether that means taking it to a bank deposit. Right. Um, I... I tried to put pictures up high. Once yeah. I knew we were going to flood, uh -huh. I put everything in plastic yeah. bags and bins. I didn't get to save everything, but I saved at least a good amount of, you know, of photos that were very sentimental. It's also important to think ahead when you're talking about where you're going to go. Yeah, because I didn't even think of that, but there should be a game plan. That's right. Plan A, B, and 42 double D. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, because... This is such an important thing to do if you have a family, because it always falls on you, the mother, to be the one to comfort and the father to comfort. So if you're prepared and they see that you're not scared because you're doing all of this, they'll give them so much more comfort and support to not be scared. And not be stressed. And fur babies count too. Oh yeah, the fur babies, you gotta put a little where you put a baggie of food in your duffel bag. Not just food, but medications, uh Kennels, if necessary. When it happens, you literally are going to be floating somewhere. So you don't have a choice now of what to bring unless you have it already prepared. So I suggest a soft duffel bag and you put stuff in there for whatever you need, like these medications. Like you had, you need allergy medication. Those That's should right. be in there because mm -hmm. you're allergic, the children are allergic to certain things. Yes. And then our fur babies, like you said, have a pouch of dog food in there at least for a couple of days mm -hmm. while everybody figures everything out. We want you to have a list, a personal list of all the things that you need to have done beforehand to prepare for a natural disaster. And then, of course, you should go online and download what FEMA says to prepare for a hurricane. Or there's a hurricane preparedness list that you can download and get those pages. It seems funny to do that, but I'm just going to put them in these wonderful cheap protectors. Yes, yes that's it's, so convenient. Yes. And then you don't have to think about it. And the list they give you might not really adapt to everything that you need. That's why it's so important to prepare your own personal list, which we're going to make you a template of. You know, the important thing is not to panic. That's everyone's instinct in a natural disaster, obviously. Right. But during a panic, it's harder to think straight. And that's yeah. why we really encourage you to prepare everything beforehand. Use the template provided. Have that hurricane preparedness list filled out and right. all the supplies ready and it takes your mind off of a lot and keeps you focused yeah so that you're not panicking before it happens because you're taking action it always gives you comfort in that and it's all in this one binder that you can take with you to make all the calls that you will need and then portable power packs are obviously handy i know that we definitely had kind of an all-in-one radio charger and it was charged. So that's a good investment. That's cranking. what you're saying. Yes. And you would, you, if it's a big hurricane, it doesn't hurt to have that. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the hurricane, it's a blessing, but you'll use it for something else. So mm -hmm. the, there are certain things on this list that you really can't do without. I can't yes. stress that enough. Take, take pictures. pictures. Take pictures of everything. Because if you could take pictures as daily, like, like you're making a movie. So you, every, you can see and show everybody that needs to see to get as much money back as you can because you have enough evidence to show them. And to justify the FEMA funds that you might be able to receive. Because you are based, your FEMA funds are based on what they come to your house and look at it, but then you can show them the pictures because sometimes by the time they get to you, you're already in the rebuilding stage. Of course, we want you to protect yourselves. When you're dealing with floods, especially, the water carries so much toxicity. Oh, 
So when so you're taking gross. pictures, yeah, you have to be sure to protect yourself, wear mm -hmm. protective gear, yeah. masks, gloves, etc. You also need to take pictures of each of the things that, you know, may seem insignificant at the time, but your belongings are also going to be things that you need to replace eventually. And sometimes you don't even know what you lost. That's right. Until it's gone. You don't know what you've got until it's gone. Well, that's certainly the truth here. It is. So the next thing to do, obviously, is start the phone calls. Oh, you yeah. want to let everyone know you're safe. Yes. Because, you know, a lot of us have people live out of state and our families. They're and we're checking with them. They're checking with us. That's so right. That has to happen. And please don't be afraid to reach out to your community because you're really going to need help with that cleanup process. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to be able to, you mm -hmm. know, ask not just your close friends and family who are able and capable of doing it, mm -hmm. but also local community your churches. outreach programs. But see, yes. you'll have all those numbers in here so that you're not thinking, who are the people I should call now? It's already going to be in here. I want to give you this list of outreaches to contact. The Hurricane Disaster Preparedness website. The American Red Cross, which I cannot say enough about. Samaritan's Purse, local churches, and other websites that list resources. Get on their radars. Do not be afraid to ask for help. There are yes. people and outreaches that are ready to help. Yes. Call and ask quickly. Some charities will put you on a list for mucking out, repairs, etc. What does mucking out mean? So when you show up to someone's house who's flooded, but, yes. you literally have to go through all of the things that have floated from one room to the other, have been touched by water, by sewage, by mud, etc. And you have to start to get rid of all that debris out yes and that's mucking out that is mucking out and Absolutely. then we had to have dehumidifiers yeah they were all sold out and then you have that's to right. i mean this you need bleach you need vinegar and so you're going to learn all that in here this yes. thing that we give you this wonderful the template template and so if you don't want to collect it all ahead of time no problem but you're going to know where to get it you're going to know what you need to go get because no one told us that mm -hmm. If money is an issue, you can do research to figure out the best places to get loans. Yes. Like the SBA. Yes, example. and that's what we ended up doing because you have to also work with the city to get permits to do everything, which I didn't know. We all know that now. So find out who's the person you call for your permit. Put that in the book. And do research on contractors and reconstruction oh. businesses yes. because uh, we had the negative experience and, mm -hmm. and don't be afraid to put your foot down, mm -hmm. to do research, to get references, to look on resources like uh, online that list local contractors. You want to go to people that have already been through um, vetting people, get mm -hmm. the list so you don't have to worry about vetting them during the recovery of this. That's right. Disaster. That's right. But there are ways to get things done, like make sure you know what they like to drink, what they like to eat, if they smoke. That's right. I just had it all there so that I kept <laughs> it going and getting them lunch because you want them to finish. All uh, legal stuff. Of only, course, but... of course, of course. <laughs> getting whatever it took because you you want to make them so happy they don't think they have to go somewhere else really quickly to do somebody el someone else's house. Refer to people you know or get references from people that you know mm -hmm. or who but, can... That's why the whole thing is about pre preparation. Yes. Preparation, preparation, preparation. If it's all in here, then you don't have to worry about so many missteps. One thing I think that would be very important to do that I wish I'd known, I would have researched what actually happens when a natural disaster happens and how other people have handled it. Mm. Like I've never, because that helps you have some awareness, which takes away some of the fear. No matter the outcome of this natural disaster, the most important thing is you're alive and that's the right. people that will, your family is alive. And that's priceless. Mm -hmm. It's hard to see something you love be destroyed, but there's still hope and you will come out on the other side of it. Yes. And then you start living so differently once it's all over. That's true. You, you know, learn. You learn that you don't save things for special occasions. Now we use our fancy stuff because yes. you could just lose it. So you yes. might as well enjoy it now. Yeah. We really hope that this helps you, and we want to give you hope. Yes, the hope and faith, you need it. Mm -hmm. and it doesn't cost anything to believe.
believe, believe, believe as you go through this that it's going to be okay eventually. That's right. So to see what we learned from our experience, watch part two, part two. And we took that tragedy and made it into a triumph. And I want that to happen for you too. So see what we've done. And it's going to be fun. And I know this is a heavy subject that we've covered today. But just know the next episode is all the DIYs we did to make our new homes so beautiful. So our Tragedy to Triumph episode will premiere this Monday, November 7th. Don't forget to subscribe and set your notifications to be alerted of mm -hmm. all new episodes. You know, it's been so fun for us that you're watching us. We appreciate it because we have so many ideas and things to do that with you subscribing to us and, you know, um, viewing us, it gives us more excitement to keep going and to give you beauty. And we'll accept any questions or anything that you have that you want to learn more about. We'll get the answers for you. So thank you for subscribing and viewing us. We appreciate it. And we wanted us to say, God bless you all and live in personal style. Be safe.